I get asked questions all the time about technology, computers, all sorts of different things related to photography. And instead of just answering in an extremely long Facebook comment, I decided it would be fun to make it into a YouTube video for Caitlin's channel here. So in today's video, we're gonna be answering your tech questions. Hey there, welcome back to the Caitlin James YouTube channel. My name is Tyler Harrington. This is a place we love to empower photographers to build both profitable and purposeful businesses while also giving you insight into Caitlin's everyday life. If you don't know who I am, my name is Tyler Harrington. I am the filmmaker, producer, manager, whatever you wanna call it, um, of this YouTube channel. Every once in a while, I'll jump on here and make videos about topics that I am more of an expert in. So what I've done is just compiled a bunch of questions that I've been tagged in on Facebook or I requested some on Instagram and I'm just gonna answer a handful right here to give you guys some sort of a longer lasting resource than just a regular old Facebook comment. So let's not waste any time, let's jump right into it. All right, so the first one is a little bit of like a softball question, one that I get asked all the time. People comment on YouTube videos asking what video camera do you use for these and what lens and all those different things and yada 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 um so just to put it out there for in case anybody's interested or wondering um as of december of 2020 we are shooting with the canon c70 um, most of the time i'm shooting which i am right now with the 24 to 70 2.8 uh lens and then what really makes the biggest difference and what people are probably noticing more than honestly the co the camera and lens combo is the lighting. So for lighting, we use the Aperture 300D um, with an Aperture Light Dome version two. I have a video on my channel that gives a little bit of like a behind the scenes um, into a filming day with Caitlin. It was a little bit older, so it was using actually the C200, which is just an older Canon cinema camera. Um, but if you're interested in seeing some more behind the scenes, how that process works, a little bit of how we make this channel happen, um, I'll link that in the description down below. Okay, the next question comes from Facebook and it says, why are SSDs so much more expensive than regular hard drives? I wanna switch over because I've heard that SSDs are more reliable, but it's five times the price of what I currently use. I currently use a Western Digital My Passport 4 terabyte, which costs about $106, but I want to switch to the Samsung SSD, which is $520 for the four terabyte. What are y'all's opinions between these? too. This is a really great question, one that we get asked all the time. Now, why there's such a huge price discrepancy, I don't actually know like the technical answer to that. I just assume that it costs more to make the SSDs than the other ones for whatever reason, and that's why they're more expensive. That's not the part that really matters though. So the biggest difference between the SSD and a standard spinning disk hard drive is comes out of a couple of different things. One, is, as she mentioned, is the portability and the reliability. An SSD doesn't have any moving parts, so there's nothing that can go wrong when you're moving it around. So if you work in a lot of coffee shops or on the couch or whatever, it's much safer because you don't have to worry about it if it gets bumped or whatever with a spinning disk drive you can really you can ruin the drive if something happens to it with an SSD um, that can't happen because there's no moving parts so that is one part the the reliability of it and the other biggest difference and the reason why SSDs are so popular is going to be the read and the write speeds are significantly faster sometimes two or three times faster than the spinning disk and it, again just comes down to the way that they're created so what's the solution well my solution for you would be to buy an SSD, but you don't need a four terabyte SSD. Um, buy the SSD and only put on there the projects that you're currently working on. So whatever you're actively editing right now where you need to have them on the go and you need uh, the fast read and write speeds so you can edit quickly, put those projects on there and then use your big, for your big four terabyte, eight terabyte, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Then you wanna look into some spinning disk drives or maybe even a RAID system or something like that. There's really no point in storing, a, you know, buying a really big four terabyte SSD to store archive long-term your footage. You're not getting any of those benefits. Something that's being archived long-term, you're not access accessing it very often, so you don't need those speeds, the really fast read and write speeds. Once it's on there, it's on there. And you're not moving it around, so you don't really need the safety and portability. So you're kind of just wasting money by you know, paying that premium price for footage to just sit on your desk or sit in a closet. So I have a video on this channel, which I'll put a card to, a, a, here somewhere and I'll, I'll link in the description down below that I kind of outline a process that I suggest for photographers that is basically how I would suggest setting up your folders and hard drives and all that sort of stuff to do what I just described. Use the SSD for current projects and then a spinning disk big hard drive for long-term archiving and storage. 
And then pro tip, if you really wanna be advanced, I actually don't think most photographers need an SSD at all. Um, I think that if you use smart previews and you store your smart previews on the internal hard drive of your laptop and you store your raw files on spinning disk drives that sit on a desk or something like that, you actually can just sort of bypass the need for a really fast SSD altogether. Now, it is so nice to have because if you like to back up your cards at a wedding and you wanna have something really fast to transfer onto and you don't wanna put all the raw files on your internal SSD, I totally get that. But if you watch that video, I describe a workflow in which you can actually work with just the internal laptop internal hard drive of your laptop and those big spinning disk drives. So go check that video out if you want more information. Next question, I'm trying to make these brief, but I'm not a very brief person. So we'll see, we'll see how it goes. All right, so this one says, good morning. I'm looking for some techie person, maybe Tyler Harrington. Hey, that's me. To offer some advice on the new M1 chip that Apple has released. Specifically, has anyone purchased and used the new iMac 24 inch for running all the things? I run Photo Mechanic, Lightroom, Blog Stomp, and InDesign, and sometimes I'll use Photoshop too. I've researched this to no end, but sometimes I just can't make sense of it all. All right. This is a great question. There's a running theme here. I made a video on my channel um, all about the M1 chip when it was first announced, kind of explaining what it is, why it's different, and what that means for us as you know creatives or whatever. So if you want all of the like nitty gritty information, go check that out. Um, but the sort of like SparkNotes version is that the M1 chip has been put in almost all the different form factors at this point. So it's in the MacBook Air, the MacBook Pro, the Mac Mini, the the new iMacs that just came out. They all are using the same exact chip. So in terms of speed and performance and all that stuff, all of those across the board are gonna be pretty close to almost the exact same performance. The main difference is that depending on the form factor, they have different, um, you know, like airflow and thermals and things like that. Like obviously um, the iMac that has really big fans and has a lot more room is gonna be able to cool itself better than a little MacBook Air, which is much smaller and doesn't have fans or whatever. And that's really only gonna impact you on anything that you're doing that's like a long sustained, like really intense, process so when you're maybe exporting a full wedding gallery you may see like a three or four minute difference between the macbook air and the imac just from the cooling alone but for just day-to-day -day stuff all you need to know is it's literally the exact same chip and from everything i've seen online now i don't have an m1 computer i've never personally used one from everything i've seen online and everything that i've read and all the youtube videos i've watched um they are more than powerful enough for the standard photographer. So running all the apps that she mentioned, you should be more than good to go with the M1 chip. So it's kind of just, it comes down to whatever form factor that you like and then choosing one and you should, you should be fine. However, I would wait to buy one if you can. Now the reason is this, this fall, there are lots of very, very strong rumors that um, Apple is going to be putting out an M1X or an M2 or some sort of a pro level version of the M1 chip. Now, I do think that's probably going to end up being overkill for what most photographers need because, again, the M1 chip alone is plenty powerful for what photographers need to do. So the pro version of the chip will probably be overkill, but, you know, it's better to have you know more power than you need than than not enough I guess. However, the the thing I would the reason I would wait is just to wait and see what they announce. Um, for two reasons: one, the price will probably come down on the M1. All the M1 products will all probably be dropped in price when like the new version comes out. So even if you don't think you need the new one, you can always get the regular M1 stuff for cheaper. But two, they're supposed to be coming out with like a 16 inch MacBook Pro version. Right now they only have a 13 inch. M1 MacBook Pro. They're supposed to be coming out the 16 inch MacBook Pro with the new M1X or whatever they end up calling it, um, which I think is what most photographers are gonna want. 13 inch screen is fine. I think that you can get by with a 13 inch screen, but for photo editing and things like that, having that 16 inch screen is really, really nice. So it may be worth it if you want that bigger screen just to hold off and wait until the fall. Um, but if you need a computer right now, or you're not interested in that or you're, whatever, you're impatient, you'll be fine with any of the M1 
products um, in that iMac would be would be great. But the next question, I might actually d deter you from buying the iMac. So just wait one second, go watch the next answer first. Okay, so here's the next question. The next question is, does anyone use a monitor to edit on instead of just a laptop? I have a 15 inch MacBook Pro, but I was thinking of either getting an iMac or saving the money and getting a monitor so I don't have to stare at this small screen while I edit. Tyler, do you have any suggestions? Okay, so this is actually a really good question and this, there's, I've seen a lot of discussion in KJ Education about iMacs versus MacBook Pros and which is better and which one should you get or whatever. And let me tell you what I personally think. If I was only a photographer and I didn't need the extra power from a, a desktop computer, which I, which I do need for like video stuff, if I was just a photographer, this is what I would do. Okay, let me paint a picture for you in your mind, okay? You are off at a coffee shop, right? You've got your laptop, you're working away. Maybe you're sitting on the couch. You're doing some emails. You're writing some blog posts. You're doing some some work. You're you're out there. You're hustling, okay? And you're like, all right, it's time to sit down and do this wedding gallery edit. I'm ready to move into like editing mode. I'm gonna go to my office and I'm going to edit, okay? So you walk into your office and on your desk of your office is a beautiful monitor, a mouse, a keyboard, and a little dock. Right, so you take your computer, you set it into the dock, you plug in one cord, a USB-C cord, into your laptop. You hit the spacebar on the on the on the on the keyboard that's sitting on your desk, and boom, up on your monitor comes Lightroom, and you have your mouse attached. You have all your hard drives are attached. You have any speakers or anything like that. Like all of the things that you need to edit are attached to your computer now your laptop that you're just working on, the blog post and all that stuff is still there because it's the same exact computer, um, but now you're looking at a gorgeous 27 inch 4K screen and you're ready to rock and roll. Now, if that sounds great to you, that's what I would suggest, okay? So I think that what I just described, so basically buying like a really nice monitor um, and having like a desk set up with all of your stuff, your hard drives, keyboard, mouse, whatever, and then just plug in your laptop to that, I think that is a better option for most photographers than buying an iMac, and here's why. The screen on the iMacs are gorgeous, right? And they are very nice, color accurate screens, 5K, whatever, all that stuff. The problem is that eventually, the iMac is gonna get old and it's gonna get slow. And your laptop is also gonna get old and it's gonna get slow. So what's gonna happen at that point? Well, then you have to buy a new iMac and a new laptop. If Or you're gonna have to buy a new laptop and then have a slow, iMac, which is where you want to do all of your like important stuff, but then, because you want the big screen, but then the iMac is slow, so you have to buy a new one. It just becomes like a mess. However, if you invest in a really nice monitor one time, that monitor will last you for years. I have monitors here that I just replaced that I've been using for over 10 years. So what I would suggest is buying that monitor, and then as you need to upgrade your laptop, your whole desk setup will also upgrade. You'll never have to really upgrade it again. You just continue to update your laptop. So what do you need to make this happen? Well, you need a really nice monitor. So I'm gonna link some, I'm gonna link all this stuff in the description down below. Basically you need a monitor that is Thunderbolt compatible. What the Thunderbolt allows you to do is allows you to plug one cord from the monitor into your computer and then that will um, transfer both data, video, and power. So that's gonna be powering your laptop, sending the video from your laptop to the monitor. And also you can, most of these monitors have you know USB ports on the back. So if you have a USB hub maybe with you know five or six different usb ports on it you can plug that into the monitor and then from there you can plug in your hard drives and all your all your other stuff and it'll all run through the monitor which will then run through your laptop and you only have the one cord that connects from the monitor to the laptop so you have to have a thunderbolt compatible monitor to do that i suggest getting a 4k one and also you want one that's color accurate again i'll link some in the description down below aside from that you need a keyboard and a mouse and then maybe like i said a usb hub or whatever but and then oh the other thing i suggest is called a henge dock it's basically just like a nice little piece of metal they sell you can probably get an amazon version of this um basically it just like sits on your desk and you can set your laptop in there and what it does it's nice is it keeps the laptop up and out of the way it doesn't take up a ton of your surface area of your desk um, because you don't actually need like the screen to be open for the laptop to connect to all of your things so that I think is the best of both worlds because again, 16 inch MacBook Pro is gonna be more than powerful enough to power the monitor and to run all of your things. You just want that bigger screen um, and it'll allow you for the system to last you years and years and years down the road without having to pay thousands of dollars every 
four, three, four, five years to upgrade the screen to a faster screen. Your screen will always be good. So buy, don't cheap out on the screen at the beginning. This is a bonus pro tip. Don't cheap out on the screen at the beginning and buy like a cheap one or one that's like kind of okay. Save up and buy like a really, really nice monitor because then you'll never have to replace it. All right, last question here. I wanna start making some promo videos for myself, but I need an editing software for video. Looking for something fairly simple to use as wondering if I should just start with iMovie or if you have any other suggestions. Great question. So I'll break this up into two camps. One, if you are on a Mac, then yes, 100%. I think starting with iMovie is a great place to start if you wanna learn video editing. It'll give you all the tools that you need to create most of the things. You know, have like built-in transitions and just learning how to do like normal cutting and editing clips together. It's gonna be a great way to learn. Um, you'll pretty, there is a definitely a cap on iMovie that you'll hit if you wanna do more advanced things or whatever, and you'll kind of know when you've reached that ceiling, like when you feel like it's holding you back. When that happens, I suggest then just moving on to Final Cut Pro. Now, Final Cut Pro is only available for Macs, which is the only kind of downside to it, but it is a one-time purchase, which is really nice. I think it's $2.99. So you pay for it one time and you have access to it for life, um, which is really great. Um, but it's basically like iMovie, but just without a cap. Like you, the possibilities are endless, but it's just as easy and intuitive to use as iMovie. So if you really wanted, you could probably start on Final Cut Pro and go from there if you want to just like skip the whole iMovie phase. But if you don't want to pay the money and you're not really sure how committed you are, start with iMovie, move to Final Cut Pro, and then that's where I'd probably sit. I would learn Final Cut Pro in and out. Like I said, you can, they edit Hollywood movies on Final Cut Pro. Like you can go really deep with it, but it's also really easy to use. Now, if you are a PC person, which and there's not very many of us out there, but if you're a PC person, your options are a little more limited. Um, I honestly don't know if Windows Movie Maker is still around. Back in the day, that used to be like the free iMovie uh, equivalent. Um, so what I would suggest for you PC users is if you have the full Adobe suite, so you don't just pay for the Lightroom and the Photoshop, you pay for the whole thing. Um, Premiere Pro is included in that. They also have Premiere Pro Rush, which is like a, um, an easier to use version. So I would start kind of looking in those two camps. Um, if you don't wanna pay, or maybe you only pay for the Lightroom and the Photoshop subscription for Adobe, then you can look into um, what's called DaVinci Resolve. Now it is free. Um, however, I will say there's probably a pretty steep learning curve. It's not as intuitive as Final Cut or iMovie. So you're probably going to need to watch some YouTube videos and some tutorials. It's gonna take a little bit of time up front to learn it, but from everything that I've been seeing lately, it's kind of like the new hot trend, like the new thing that people are moving away from Premiere, because Premiere is a little bit buggy and has some quirks of its own. Um, so DaVinci is a great place to start. Like if you start learning on DaVinci, you'll be set for a long time. Um, and it may not be a bad place to like cut your teeth and kind of learn. Just know it's gonna be a little tougher upfront. All right, there you go. Those are mostly computer related questions, but hopefully those were helpful to you guys. Um, I'd love to do this again in the future. So if you have any more questions that are tech related or even like kind of tech adjacent or whatever, um, leave those in the comments down below. And if we get enough of them, maybe sometime down the road, I can make another video just like this. Um, Caitlin will be back next week with our regularly scheduled programming. Thank you all so much for watching. If you want to see more content just like this, you want to see more videos from Caitlin, we've got a bunch of good stuff coming up. We've got the 100 millimeter RF video that's going to be coming soon um, and lots of really great content. Make sure you subscribe down below so you don't miss an upload. We upload every Thursday. So we will see you back here next Thursday. Thank you so much for watching and see you later. Bye.